you take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> Danny, you don't forget this. I finally gave you one? Fine. <laughs> Fine. Revelation 21. We are actually coming to the end of our summer study on prophecy. Uh, and it has by no means been exhaustive. Um, we have just skimmed along the surface and given you a bit of a timeline as to what the future holds. Um, but I hope that somehow it has kind of uh, cleared up some things for you or helped you in some way. Uh, but one of the things that it should do in each of our lives is it should prompt us to want to know more and to dig deeper in our own personal study. Um, and so as we wrap things up tonight, we are going to be looking at what has been called the eternal state or heaven uh, and uh, our future there. Uh, I was listening to a song on the way here this evening um, by Phil Wickham, and some of you may know it. It's called The Hymn of Heaven or Heaven's Hymn. But one of the opening lines is, I long to breathe the air of heaven. Can you imagine that first breath of per that perfect air, of a perfect environment? Uh, and that is in our future for the child of God. So as we wrap things up tonight, I want to just give you a little bit of an idea of what next week holds. Um, we're going to begin, and I really don't know how many weeks it's going to be, but we're going to begin an exposition of Romans chapter 12, and we're going to do an in-depth study on practical Christianity. Because if there is a passage of scripture that truly deals with practical Christianity, where your faith meets the road, uh, is Romans 12. And so we're going to spend some time in that and just really try to dig deeply into it so we have a clear uh, understanding. The question was asked uh, several years ago to a group of young people, children. How would you describe eternity? Well, uh, for most of us, if we were to try to answer that question, we'd be saying, you know, unending happiness, contentment, joy, perfection, peace, Whatever may come to mind, and the fact of the matter is, is that when, however we describe heaven, it's not going to be complete, because we really can't imagine just how glorious and wonderful heaven is going to be. But this group of children uh, tried their best to describe what they thought heaven would be like. And uh, a little guy by the name of Micah, by the, uh, uh, age three, said this. The best part of heaven is the party that Jesus is going to give us. Lots of babies will be in heaven. If we need our dolls, Jesus will have them there. Uh, not quite sure about the theology of that, but it's cute to see what kids think. Uh, Emily, age seven, said there are roads of gold, gates of pearl, and after you've walked through the gates of pearl, I think you might see a humongous throne. I think the throne is made out of bricks of gold and outlined with pearls, decorated with emeralds, maybe even rubies. I don't know if I'm right, but I do know that you will have to have bare feet. Uh, Isaac Age 11 said, heaven will be like living in the clouds with Christ, and you can rollerblade on streets of gold. Peter will give you fishing lessons, lessons, and we'll all be able to fly. We'll play tag in the sky, and the trees will be made of gold and the leaves of silver. My point is, is that heaven is going to be wonderful. And yes, indeed, heaven is going to be wonderful. It is beyond our ability to understand or even contemplate. The reality is, is as human beings, we are restricted to the extent of our imagination. And our imagination is restricted 
to what we know and see and can touch, what we can physically understand. Uh, but heaven is going to be completely outside of our ability to even dream about of how splendorous and wonderful it will be. So I want to do something a little bit uh, different this evening. And I hope it's not going to be too painful for us. But we're going to read the last two chapters of Revelation. All right. And uh, uh, I believe that if we read it and we really focus on what God is saying here, that it can give us just a little bit of a glimpse of what awaits us. John, or, uh, Revelation 21, John writes, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto the stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and names thereon, written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with of the reed twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of the man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was as jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, and the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. 
and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that is defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were the, for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And let and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Uh, we have some pretty exciting days ahead of us. Uh, somebody gave me back a few years ago one of those transfer things that you can stick on a wall, and it's in my office, and it says the best is yet to come. Uh, and I look at it periodically because sometimes you need to be reminded that the best is yet to come. Uh, and that day is coming uh, for each and every one of us, one way or another, either through death or through the rapture, we are going to be home where we belong. Uh, heaven is going to be wonderful. Uh, and Revelation 22 or 21 and 22 give us just a little bit of a peek as to what heaven is going to be like. Uh, it's interesting that we talk about the streets of gold, but when you hear the description that's given by John of the streets of gold, they are transparent as glass. That's because it is perfect. No impurities whatsoever. Everything about that city is going to be perfect. Nobody's going to need to uh, take Tylenol to deal with the aches and pains. Nobody's going to have to uh, send anything away for repairs. It is going to be complete perfection all the way around for each and every one of us. 
And so the splendor of heaven as we think of it tonight, I want to just deal with um, as a place that is prepared for us from before the foundations of the world. Uh, I want us to take a look from these chapters and from other passages throughout scripture of the things that are not going to be there and the things that are going to be there. Uh, we are going to be continually in the presence of God, to see the face of God and to walk in the light of his presence. And we read of that in chapter 22 and verse 4 and chapter 21 and verse 23. Uh, but we are told that there's no temple in heaven in chapter 21 and verse 22. Uh, but that's not all that's lacking. There's a lot more that we're not going to see there. There's no more seeds in chapter 21, verse 21. There's no more tears, death, sorrow, crying, or pain. Chapter 21 and verse 4. Anybody at all tempted to say amen? <laughs> just, just maybe a little. There's no more sin. Chapter 21, verse 8. There's no more fear. Chapter 21, verse 12. There's no more sun or moon. Chapter 21, verse 23. There's no more night. Chapter 21, verse 25. There's no more sin or evil. Chapter 21, verse 27. No more disease or injuries. Chapter 22 and verse 2. And no more curse. Chapter 22 and verse 3. Now, it would be enough to call this place heaven from the list of what it lacks. But that would tell half the story. Because what is there is even more exciting. Uh, there is unending fellowship with God. Chapter 21, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 22. There is unending newness. Chapter 21, verse 5. There is unending water of life. Chapter 21, verse 6, and chapter 22, verse 1. There is unimaginable beauty. Chapter 21, verse 11, and verse 21. There is uncompromising security. Verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 12. There is unbroken unity between believers. Chapter 21, verse 12 and 14. There will be no more church splits. There's going to be no more arguing amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no going to be no more hurt feelings and nobody uh, going home and crying the blues or talking about somebody else. There will be perfect unity amongst God's children. And uh, that in itself is something to look forward to. Amen. All right. Uh, there is unlimited holiness, chapter 21, verse 16. There is unparalleled size, chapter 21, verse 6, or 16. There is untold wealth, chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. There is unending light, chapter 21, verse 23, and chapter 22, and verse 5. There's unrestricted access, chapter 21, verse 25. There is unending fruit from the tree of life, chapter 22 and verse 2. There is unceasing service to God, chapter 22 and verse 3. And there is unending reign of God, chapter 22 and verse 5. We, uh, we can't even begin to talk about all that awaits us. Uh, Randy Alcorn has written a book called Heaven, and uh, he does a very in-depth study on what the Bible says about every aspect of heaven. And uh, if you get a chance to read it or grab a copy of it, uh, it is a very in-depth uh, study on the subject of heaven. So beyond all these thrilling descriptions from Revelation, we also know from other passages of Scripture what heaven is like. Uh, that we know that it will be a place of rest, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and Revelation 14, verse 13. We know that it will be a place of full knowledge, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 12. We know that it will be a place of complete and perfect holiness. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 and Ephesians 2 and verse 21. 
It will be a place of utter joy. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19 and Jude verse 24. It will be a place of glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. And it will be a place of worship. Revelation 7 verses 9 through 12. One of our teenagers uh, back a couple of years ago sent me a note and said, Pastor, I'd really like to know what we're going to do in heaven because I get bored easy. Uh, I'm pretty confident that none of us are going to be bored in the slightest possible way. Uh, we are a people that uh, oftentimes need constant stimulation or something going on. We need to be involved in something. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be involved in constant worship of our Heavenly Father. We are going to be singing his praises. We're going to be bowing before him. We are going to be living in perfection that we cannot in this world completely fathom. Uh, with all that heaven and eternity have to offer, it's hard to see why anyone would deliberately decide not to go there. Why anyone would turn their back on Jesus Christ. As believers, and as a Bible-preaching church, we know that the world does not like us. Uh, and you have, most of you have experienced that firsthand. Uh, back a couple of Sundays ago, in fact, it was the day, the Sunday we had our baptismal service. Um, I was heading up to the car. Pretty much everybody was gone. There were still a few people in the parking lot, and I was carrying out the baptismal robes to take home to be washed and, and uh, brought back. And uh, a car was going by, and uh, it started honking as it got to the first driveway, and it honked all the way by. And at first I thought the gentleman, and I use the term gentleman loosely, uh, at first I thought he was waving out the window. Uh, but he wasn't waving out the window. Uh, he was giving us a uh, very rude salute. And uh, the reality is we know that, that the world hates us. We are told that in Scripture. We are told that in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. But there is so much for us to look forward to. Uh, I was talking to someone just yesterday about uh, they had a friend die, and they said, the older I get, the fewer people I know here on earth, the more people I know in heaven. And, and that is true. And it makes heaven that much sweeter for all of us. The more loved ones we have that have gone home makes us desire to be home. To be free from the chains of this sin-sick world and to be completely surrounded by God's protection. Uh, it is coming, folks. And the beauty of the last two chapters of Revelation is it gives us such a clear description. And it's hard for us to imagine it. It's hard for us to get a mind's eye picture, but uh, it is going to be beyond your wildest imagination. Uh, verse 23 of chapter 21 and the city had no need of the sun neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof uh, it is just beyond what we can possibly understand another young girl that uh, commented on what she thought heaven was like said this heaven will be the greatest place ever but mainly because Jesus will be there. To get to this place, though, you must receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, and that is indeed the case. You know, every church, and I, I am convinced of this, and uh, it, it grieves my heart to say it, but every church has churchgoers 
who are not believers. They have people that come and sit and occupy their seat week after week after week after week for years, and they do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And it, it is unfathomable that, that that can be the case, but when the rapture does occur, there are going to be people from Golden Harvest that I'm sure will be left behind. I don't like to say that, but if it's like any other church, there will be some who have played the part without reality, without really knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And so that's why we preach, and that's why we, we uh, week after week after week, we hammer home so often the same message. Because though we hear it, sometimes it doesn't register. Uh, we are told throughout Scripture that the old heaven and the old earth are going to be destroyed. Psalm 102, verses 25 and 26 says, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture. Shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. In Isaiah 51, and verse 6, it says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Christ himself said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Perhaps the most extended section of scripture dealing with the passing away of the old heaven and the old earth is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, which says this. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt, melt with perfect heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall mount with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You know, the old heavens and the old earth have to pass away to make room for the new. And that which is stained and decaying must make room for that which is utterly pure and eternal. Uh, in this world, in case you haven't noticed, is decaying. It is heading towards destruction. Uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ, I believe, needs to wake up. Is that what it is? All right. Thank you, CNN. Um, and and I, I, I don't... Part of me understands why the church has kind of like lulled to sleep. And part of me doesn't understand uh, I know that we all get into a, uh, a routine, if you will, and we, we kind of become lackadaisical, and we just kind of uh, go from day to day to day in our routines, and we, we don't always think of, and we're not always mindful of, the fact that one of these days is going to be my last day. And I need to redeem the time. I need to be busy doing everything I can to keep friends and loved ones out of hell. Uh, and, you know, as much as Revelation 21 and 22 describe heaven, 
we are also told throughout scripture the descriptions of hell and how horrific it truly is. And so uh, we need to do the very best we can to make the message clear day in and day out. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, there are times where this whole live streaming stuff drives me nuts. You know, it just, I, I think, and I've said it before, it's created lazy Christians that stay home and don't go to church and don't get the fellowship that they need with other believers. And as a result, there's no obligation. There's no, uh, there's nothing expected of them. They just kind of exist. But at the same time, being online is opening up a broader audience for the message. That people are hearing the gospel. And so if there are people watching online tonight on either one of our formats, we want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you and died for you. And that heaven is real. And that one day, Jesus Christ is coming back again for his church. And you need to make peace with God and you need to trust him as your personal Savior before it's everlastingly too late. So, uh, there is a lot of discussion about where this new heaven and new earth are going to be located. Uh, and I'm going to share with you some writings from a few different Bible expositors and commentators. Uh, just to kind of try to answer that question. After the universe is cleansed by fire and God creates this new heaven and new earth, all the vestiges of the curse and of Satan's presence are going to be done away with. And uh, they will be utterly and completely removed from creation. Uh, Bible expositor Albert Barnes says this, The earth will be no more cursed and will produce no more thorns and thistles. Man will be no more compelled to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. Woman will be no more doomed to bear the sufferings which she does now. And the abodes of the blessed will be no more cursed by sickness, sorrow, tears, and death. Ron Rhodes, in his book, The End Times in Chronological Order, says this. The new heaven and the new earth will be this present universe. Only it will be purged of all evil, sin, suffering, and death. Now, this is interesting. The Greek word used to designate the newness of the cosmos is not neos, which is normally the word that is used to relate to that which is new in origin, but it is kainos. Neos means new in time or new in origin, but kainos, which is used to describe the new heaven and new earth, means new in nature or new in quality. So the phrase new heavens and new earth refers not to a cosmos that is totally other than the present one. Rather, the new cosmos will stand in continuity with the present cosmos, but it will be utterly renewed and renovated. J. J. Oswald Saunders uh, makes a similar comment. And he writes, the picture is of the universe transformed, perfected, purged of everything that is evil and that exalts itself against God. It is new, not in the sense of being a new creation, but of being new in character, a worthy setting for the residence of God's redeemed people. John Piper writes, what happens to our bodies and what happens to the creation go together. For what happens to our bodies is not annihilation, but redemption. Our bodies will be redeemed, restored, made new, but not thrown away. And so it is with the heavens and the earth. Because you and I are so accustomed to living in a fallen world uh, that has been viciously marred by sin and corruption, uh, we cannot really conceive of a life in a heavenly habitat that is free of sin and evil. Uh, but it's coming. And it is something that it, it, it almost 
produces in the believer a homesickness, a desire to be there, a desire to be free of this present world. Uh, and if you don't have that, man, I, you just got to get into your Bible and study this subject and get into some deep books and understand the reality of heaven and the totality or description of heaven. Because it is truly beyond anything we can imagine in this present world. From birth to death, we are confronted with imperfection on every level. Everywhere we turn, we're surrounded by imperfection. But in this eternal city, we will experience nothing but perfection. Uh, I'll close tonight with A.T. Pearson's description of heaven. He says, there shall be no more curse. There will be perfect restoration. The throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. There will be perfect administration. His servants shall serve him. There will be perfect subordination. They shall see his face. There will be perfect transformation. And his name shall be on their foreheads. That will be perfect identification. And there shall be no more night there. And they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light. That is perfect illumination. And they shall reign forever and ever. That is perfect exaltation. There's a uh, song when I was a teenager, and I wish I could remember the whole, uh, used to be a melody of songs all combined together, but one of the songs in that was, Heaven is a Wonderful Place, Filled with Glory and Grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful, heaven is a glorious, heaven is a wonderful place. And then it went on and said, but until then, my heart shall go on singing. Until then, with joy will carry on. Until the day my eyes behold that city. Until the day God calls us home. Aren't you excited? Yeah. Man, I tell you, sometimes, and I know that we've had Young, young adults in the, the study over the course of the summer that have said that this kind of overwhelms them, you know, when they think of all the prophecy and all of the, the, the seven trumpets judgments and the seal judgments and the vile judgments, it's just kind of overwhelming. But we're the good part now, right? We're the part where the cathedrals used to sing that song, I've read the back of the book, and we win. Uh, and we indeed do. Right now, life is a little bit difficult. Right now, we are going through horrible circumstances. Right now, we are subject to losing loved ones, and we're subject to disease, and we're subject to all the harsh realities that this world has to give. But this world is not our home. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Good night. This is a Baptist church at John Ward. We're going home. Amen. And we are going to see some sights that we cannot even begin to imagine tonight. It's exciting stuff, folks. There's no reason for a child of God to mope around in this life looking like you've been sucking on dill pickles and persimmons. There is no reason for us to be complaining. There is no reason for us to feel sorry for ourselves. Man, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we are on the winning team. And we get all of this and heaven as well. We can't, the truth is we can't comprehend this place. No. We can't, we cannot, human beings, no. we cannot comprehend heaven. The human we mind no. eternal life. Life. Yeah, we can't comprehend it. Yeah. So Absolutely. When we were, when we were, uh, when we were little, we used to get excited about Christmas coming, didn't we? Yeah. We did. Yeah. Yeah. So how come we're not excited yeah. about this coming? Yeah. The Lord's coming. Absolutely. <laughs> we we uh most of us would 
say, I would much rather that the Lord just rapture us all home rather than us face death, right? right? We're not, most of us aren't excited about the prospect of dying. Right. But dying is simply closing your eyes yeah. in this sin-sick world and opening them in heaven, in the presence of God. Uh, there is nothing to fear for the child of God of what death holds. It's not pretty in this life. It's not, it's not pretty as we experience the death of a loved one, but it is a graduation ceremony. It's, it's a promotion. It is that blessed event that we all anticipate and we all long for to breathe the air of heaven, to be able to be in the presence of the God that loves us and sent his son to die for us. Hallelujah! Man! The world says everybody's going to heaven. I've heard it so many times, it doesn't matter. Well, how you live, you're going to go to heaven. But when you read Revelation 21 and go back to verse 7, yeah. he that overcometh Someplace along the line, you have to overcome this thing. We have to be overcome. Shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelievers, those that yes. fear in this world, and an unbeliever, they're listed with murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, and they shall all have their part in the lake which burns. Brimstone, which is the second death. Mm -hmm. So the world says we're all getting, we're all going to get there. But when we read this, it says the heyday, we're not all going to get there. Yeah. It's pretty. Uh, Broad is the way that leads to Lord destruction. Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And many there be that go there. I don't think there's going to be as many there in the last few days as we think there might be. You know, we've got apathy. We've got so many that don't care. And, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm fearful for them. Yeah. Folks, I'm preaching uh, Sunday morning um, from 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 20 through 25. Um, on The title is, I Will Serve Thee Because I Love Thee. It's on service. Uh, and my purpose is not to make these people who feel guilty and thereby jump in and do something. It is to impress upon all of us the fact that we must not be spectators in this business of serving Christ. That we must be investors and we must be busy and we must be involved. And, uh, uh, you know, I believe with my whole heart <clears throat> that there's going to be a lot of tears from a lot of people one day. You know, Revelation says that God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. And I believe on that day of accountability, that day of judgment, there's going to be tears shed by believers for the things they did not do, for the opportunities that they missed, for the things that they did that they shouldn't have done. And God, because he is a loving and gracious Heavenly Father, is going to wipe all tears from our eyes. But John 14, verse 6 is still in the Bible. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is one way, right? Old vacation Bible school song. One way is only one. Or one door and only one way. And yet it's I can prove it. I'm on the inside. On which side are you? Amen. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and we will, for the first time this summer, finish on time. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this evening and for the opportunity to look into your word. We thank you, Father, for the book of Revelation. And, uh, Father, we know that there are very difficult days ahead for this world. But we also know that for the child of God, <clears throat> there are glorious times ahead. And Father, we pray 
that you would help us until that day, whether you take us home by death or whether you call us home in the rapture. Until that day, we will be busy serving our blessed Lord and Savior. Father, we love you. And Father, what better way for us to show that love for you than by rolling up our sleeves and being busy in these last days. Father, bless us as we leave this place. Bring us back again on the Lord's day. And Father, I pray that you truly meet with us this coming Sunday. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Just a matter of interest. I left the truck with Tim Hortons in the morning. I went back up in the afternoon. I sat down the table. I came back to Sarah in the afternoon. Well, I'll tell you that.